are two film characters that made little primary school me grow up in ways that were unconsciously confusing. Dr. Chase Meridian in Batman Forever and Kirsten Dunst's Mary Jane, a character that everyone hates so much that most people consider her the real villain. The criticism tends to be she's whiny, unreasonable, and inconsiderate of Peter's responsibility. Spider-Man gets attacked all the time. This isn't about you. This is about me. Which is a particularly big crime, because what made her comic counterpart so appealing was how she complimented Peter Parker's life, from not needing an excuse to leave and fight Rhino on their first meeting, to her famously choosing to be there for him while he's angry and grieving after Gwen's death. In the Raimi trilogy, MJ dates Harry behind his back, even though in this version they strongly fancy each other then makes out with Spider-Man behind Harry's back. I'm not saying Toby's Peter's entirely innocent since he continues to move in on her while Harry isn't around. So you just came by? I was in the neighborhood. I took two buses and I had to get in the neighborhood. In Spider-Man 2, she almost gets married at the age of 19 to get over and at Peter. And once again, when he gives her the opportunity to start an affair, she eventually takes it. Furthermore, the way she figures out she doesn't love her new fiancé comes from kissing him the same way she did with Spidey back in the day. Which seems like a very shallow way to judge someone. And in the end, she leaves him at the altar. So he's publicly humiliated. Finally, in Spider-Man 3, she again almost cheats on Peter Parker because she feels neglected, even though he goes out of his way to support her play bring her to a Ponzi restaurant and is encouraging despite the poor reviews. You just gotta believe in yourself and you get right back on the horse. And... Don't give me the horse thing. Try and understand how I feel. Furthermore, she breaks up with him when Harry threatens to kill him, even though earlier Peter Parker almost beat Harry to death. As a film construct, MJ is extremely dated and very poorly thought out, someone that lacks agency. As her career develops, and for some reason changes from acting to singing, it never impacts her development. She's perpetually and narratively just an object to be retrieved in a conflict never her own. Hold on, Mary Jane! These are all terrible objective issues. However, if we take account of her psychological profile as someone raised in an abusive home, then I believe it's a lot easier to examine her with a more sympathetic eye and appreciate how she contributes to the broader theme of identity. By the way, since I'm re-entering the Raimiverse, I've got to make it very clear. I don't hate these films. In fact, I love them. I just hate the grip they have over the entire Spider-Man discourse, where they're often used to attack or dismiss Tom and Andrews, even though they went to great lengths to be closer to Stan's original themes and ideas, efforts that were never appreciated because people often take the Raimi changes as gospel. But whatever, my hot air was released with the other videos, so it's all love from here. Unless people still want to fuck. When we get there, we'll throw a big feed. The main struggle of the Raimi trilogies is how fantasies shape our identities. The trio we follow, Harry, Peter and MJ, all have false self-images that were created as a response to the limitations of their upbringing and experiences as teenagers. The quotations are important because they all look 30. Harry was neglected by his father, but he's still loyal because of a false idealistic image he has of him. Creep is my father, alright? If I'm lucky, I'll become half of what he is. So just keep your mouth shut about stuff you don't understand. One that becomes poison. Peter was raised with love, but ironically, his humble and elderly parental figures weren't as hip as what MJ was into, so he fantasizes about something else in life, but eventually lives out his uncle's fantasy. Quite the departure from the comics, but whatever. Subsequently, Mary Jane had the Vegas, but also the saddest background. She grew up with an alcoholic and abusive father who calls her trash, while the more perfect idealistic Parkers live next door, reminding her every day of what she didn't have. Were you listening to that? No. However, due to her attractiveness, she's popular in school. Therefore, there's a disparity that's produced between the loving fantasy version of herself and the little girl who just gets treated like dirt by fat men wearing tank tops. As a result, MJ's self-esteem is all messed up because she's torn between two identities that feel equally valid and yet contradictory. As I quote from Maurice Rosenberg's study, when we speak of high self-esteem, then we shall simply mean that the individual respects himself, considers himself worthy. Low self-esteem, on the other hand, implies self-rejection, self-dissatisfaction, self-contempt. The individual lacks respect for the self he observes. The self-picture is disagreeable, and he wishes it were otherwise. By the way, 10 points to anyone who recognizes this quote. Like MJ's relationship with Harry, she wants to feel validated as someone more than her environment, more than her self-image, but- And I won't tell Harry. No, don't tell Harry. I won't. That mask, that ideal self, is deeply superficial and isn't a substitute for old-fashioned love, the one that Peter offers. Some dream, huh? That's nothing to be embarrassed about. Consequently, these three relationships, love, neglect, and abuse, form what I pretentiously like to call the Raimi thematic self-esteem fantasy matrix. 
rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? That every character in conflict feeds back into within the trilogy. Peter vs Norman was about being loyal to Uncle Ben's fantasy and not being taken advantage of by Normans. Be a son to me now. I have a father. His name was Ben Parker. Peter vs Ark was about beating the fancy of being responsible without sacrifice, even though it's kind of contradicted because at the end he does get it both ways. Harry vs Peter was about letting go of the fantasy of Norman. He loved me. No, he despised you. You were an embarrassment to him. Peter vs Venom vs Sandman was all about Avi Arad's fantasy. The line, my mind was playing tricks too. Effectively summarizes everyone's experience in the ramifications of poor self-esteem where dreams of once substitute reality. The tragedy of Mary Jane's fantasy battle is that it's not about a man wearing an evil and recognizable costume. It's the fantasy of being worthy of love. Only a friend? Peter Parker? That's all I have to give. One that's always being proven to be illusory by how often she's rejected and embarrassed in her adulthood. Do what you need to with her, then broom her fast. Short six dollars. Next time that happens, I'm gonna take out your check. John has seen my show five times. Even my father, he came backstage to borrow cash. But my best friend, who cares so much about me, can't make an eight o'clock curtain. <laughs> One critic? No, all the papers, dear. What do you mean? You know exactly what I mean. That was our kiss. Do you want to push me away? <laughs> Peter, stop it! By the way, I'm not excusing her various affairs and poo-poo actions, but it's important to understand they're all consistent under the mental health profile of trauma. Of course, I'd be talking about trauma. Through the lens of the words, You're trash! You're always gonna be trash, just like her! I have to go to school! Ah, oh, stop. We can understand the identity she's trying to escape. An identity made up of memories that are so painful that it's impossible for her to use with them and imagine a future that isn't trash or more abuse. I look at these words, and it's like my father wrote them. All cars, all cars in the vicinity of 54th and 6th Avenue. Go get them, Tiger. MJ's intense insecurity, need for validation, and attention doesn't come from vanity but is a byproduct of a wound in her mind that never healed. Because every new identity she makes is contradicted by another force. The scene that I think beautifully encapsulates with this is in Spider-Man 3, where she's fired, she walks out, is applauded, it's all revealed to be directed towards Spider-Man. The universe never allows Mary Jane to be ever convinced that she's worthy of her fantasies. The only support she gets is from Peter. However, there's a limit to how regularly he can give it. I want to be here for you. Okay, I get it. Thank you. But um, I'm fine. I, I don't need your help. But it's also within this relationship that she learns to live without any fantasy metric of worth, where she can look inside herself and see what she truly wants. I want to face them with you. It's wrong that we should only be half alive, half of ourselves. It's not public success or escape, it's a home. I've always been standing in your doorway. Mary Jane and Sam Raimi's trilogy shows us that compromise is where fantasy and reality meets. A place where our emotional strength transforms us into more than just what we want, all symbolized by her final image. MJ accepts Peter Parker's hand, even after her heart is broken. And that's fucking beautiful. Maybe all we need is different. It's hard at this speed to see anything. Just tell me what you need, and I'll listen. Childhood abuse puts people at risk of depression and PTSD, participating in harmful activities, having difficulties in relationships, and having negative beliefs and attitudes towards others. Each of these increases the likelihood of health problems, and they are highly related to each other. Everybody needs help sometimes, Peter. Even Spider-Man. Obviously, my academic diagnosis doesn't absolve all the character's faults, her passiveness still sucks. If they made Spider-Man 4, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have had her confront her father and resolve her trauma, she'd probably get kidnapped by the Vulture or something. 
And I'm not too hot over the idea of making MJ Peter Parker's first and only love, since letting go of different girls is such a crucial part of his growth. John Semper, the showrunner of Spider-Man the Anime series, even had to fight to make it so on his show. Furthermore, as I mentioned before, one of the most realistic and relatable superhero comic scenes I've ever seen was when Peter thought to himself, once I thought I couldn't live without her. Now she's just another girl named Betty. Boy, have I grown up in these past few months. I realize now, we never had anything in common. It's just that she was the first girl I loved. However, I strongly believe to dismiss all the subtleties in Raimi's MJ and how it contributes back into the broader narrative mosaic would be a shame. But there's still one more aspect I want to engage in, which is how her differences as an adaptation deconstructs Stan's original MJ in a way that Toby's differences didn't. But that's involved in a different and bigger discussion, where Kirsten Dunst isn't the centre, but Zendaya's Michelle Jones is. Anyways, this was a rambling of an idiot in his 20s trying to justify his childhood crush in a video watched by a few hundred strangers. What a f***ing life. So yeah, I'm remaking my old comparing MJ video, which randomly got over 600k views back in the day. I was never really happy with it because I made it during the height of my university stress and I was letting my patrons vote for what essays to do every week. So I literally wrote, voiced and edited the whole thing in like two days. The current plan is to split the analysis into three videos, one for Kirsten Dunst, one for Zendaya and one for every single version. So yeah, special thanks to everyone on Patreon again. And, uh, I don't know, Gucci. There's this sweaty guy in the tower with us. I think he, like, works for you or something. I'd like a cheeseburger.